states in the Middle East. Uh, a flood of concepts go through your mind as you, you think of all of that, and uh, extraordinarily complex. But we'll leave it to our, our speaker to unravel all of those threads for us. He said he doesn't have a solution to all of the problems. <laughs> Ambassador Satterfield was born in Baltimore. Not on his resume is the fact that he's a graduate of Mount Hebron High School. Very seldom do our speakers bring along a rooting section. But this, this is occurring. And of course, it's a time for high school graduations, as you all know. And one. In Baltimore, if, if you have a school that's had the number one girls team in lacrosse for a long time, <laughs> you have to mention it, don't you? They've had a, a really splendid, uh, splendid record. He's also a graduate of the University of Maryland. <laughs> the applause may get thinner, but Georgetown University School of Law. <laughs> He entered the State Department in 1980. Now, I thought there'd be someone who would clap at that particular <laughs> point. He's, uh, he's been assigned to uh, several places overseas, of course, uh, Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, Tunis, and uh, Beirut, Damascus. Uh, at the State Department, he served in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs, the Bureau of South, Africa, uh, or South Asian Affairs, and uh, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. And some of his specific assignments have included being director of the uh, Executive Secretariat staff. He uh, also was with the, uh, assigned to the National Security Council for three years as their director for uh, uh, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, 93 to 96. An interesting period of time covering some of the most trying problems that we have today as well as then. And uh, at the State Department later, uh, he was director of the Israel and Arab-Israeli Affairs Office. At present, he is deputy secretary within the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. Um, I was going to list the countries that uh, are his direct responsibilities, responsibilities which parallel other deputy directors within the Bureau. But it's easier to simply say that it doesn't include the, the Gulf states, and it doesn't include Iran and Iraq. <laughs> but almost everything else that's in this area is, is one of his responsibilities. And we're going to have the pleasure of uh, hearing his treatment, the position of the United States, uh, with respect to some of the most serious of the issues within that region. It's my great pleasure to introduce and present the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, Ambassador David M. Satterfield. Well, thank you very much. As uh, Fred said in his opening remarks, I don't have uh, solutions to all of the problems that I'll be outlining tonight, and I suspect you have on your minds. Uh, that comes after you've retired and you're paid for these events, then you offer the solutions. Uh, wh when you're working on them, you can just outline the difficulties. But I do thank you for coming up here. It's a special pleasure to, uh, to be back in Baltimore. This is my hometown. It's uh, the first time I've had in quite a few years to speak up here. Uh, but I do look forward to this evening. What I would like to do is open by taking a look at some of the salient issues that affect the United States and the Middle East. Uh, with a focus on the war on terror, its implications for us, of course, the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli -Israeli crisis, uh, and some words about the future of the Middle East in a more human and humane sense, economics, development of civil society, building the blocks for a different kind of Middle East for those who live there uh, than the past has seen. And then, of course, I'll take your questions that can be on any topic, whether I've raised them or not. There are three major issues uh, which concern any American today uh, as we look at the Middle East. The war on terrorism and our broader concerns about regional security. 
the critical importance of achieving a comprehensive, just and lasting Arab-Israeli peace, uh, certainly ending this current terrible Palestinian-Israeli crisis, and the profound longer-term economic, social, and political challenges that face peoples and leaderships in the region. I want to offer an American perspective on each of these. Next week, you'll have the honor and pleasure of having Rafi Barak, the uh, charge at the Israeli embassy, who is also quite an accomplished speaker and quite eloquent in presenting the Israeli point of view on these things. And I know Rafi uh, will challenge you and be challenged in turn by your questions. Uh, so you've got a treat in store for you uh, when you see him. But I'm offering an American administration perspective on these questions. Since September 11th, it seems to us that the United States has been quite clear about what we stand against. And we'll talk about that a bit, but I'd also like to convey a sense of what the United States stands for, about which we've not always been so clear. Eight months after September 11th, American resolve to fight the terrorists who attacked us is as strong as ever. You'll find that sentiment deep-rooted throughout the United States. There's no tolerance in this country, no tolerance among Americans for the notion that any political cause justifies the attacks that we witnessed against innocent civilians, none at all. In poll after poll, Americans have emphasized their determination to crush the Al-Qaeda terrorists who killed 3,000 of our citizens, as well as to confront those states that sponsor and harbor terrorist organizations. Americans also worry deeply about the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and missile systems, particularly among those states, including in the Middle East, whose past behavior has threatened the security not only of their neighbors, but of the world more broadly. I urge you not to underestimate the power of this new determination on the part of the United States. This isn't about passing trends or partisan infighting. It defines a large part of what Americans want to see in our foreign policy. And it would be foolish to assume that our interest or our attention span is going to fade. That applies also to concerns about the Iraqi regime. Saddam's ruthless repression of his own people, his serial aggressions against his neighbors, hardly need to be mentioned, certainly in this audience. Saddam has brought nothing but fear and misery to the people of Iraq and nothing but ruin to one of the Arab world's once most promising countries. Since September 11th, as President Bush has said publicly, the United States and our partners and friends in the Middle East have a reinforced a shared interest in fighting Al-Qaeda, in fighting these terrorists. We welcome their help. They are doing it from their self-interest and yours and ours, and we need to find ways to continue to build on their cooperation. But we should not pretend that the problem of fighting terrorism ends with Osama bin Laden's organization. It doesn't. It extends to the much broader agenda of stopping the terrorist activities, activities that take place around the world by other groups, some of whom are more shadowy, others of whom, like Hezbollah, are all too well known, sadly, to the United States. All states, including those who harbor terrorist organizations, are going to need to make choices, difficult choices, painful choices, but choices nevertheless about where their best interests lie. The President has done his best to try to send a very clear message. Those choices should be against terror and with us. Certainly, states that join with us in this campaign against global terror will find us a steady and reliable friend. Those who do not will find the seeds of future problems, future tension between us, and not the normal relations which we believe they and we seek. Turning to the other side of the coin and addressing an issue much on the minds of Americans today, the Arab-Israeli crisis, it seems to me, and I think most Americans, that we have a profound interest in showing that terrorism, violence, the use of force can never bring about the just, comprehensive, and lasting peace that administration after administration in the United States has advocated and worked hard for. We have an equally compelling interest, though, as we describe what cannot work in describing what can. We believe a political process, in the end, is the route to that lasting settlement, that just settlement. 
And this is also something that we believe unites Americans to a degree that may surprise many in this room and others around the United States. Recent polling done by the University of Maryland in Shibli Tahami's excellent center uh, on the Middle East and other institutions shows that an overwhelming majority of Americans accept the need for active American leadership in finding a resolution that produces Middle East peace. They want to cooperate with others in the international community, with Russia, the United Nations, the European Union, the so-called quartet, which has worked so closely with us over these past months. They support the principle of land for peace and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. They want us to take a balanced position between the parties although they tilt very heavily against those who would use violence and terror against civilians, particularly the scourge of suicide bombings. And this is also something that needs to be taken into account as those who look at the American process reflect upon where we are and where we're going. I've spent much of the last uh, year, tragic year, in the Middle East. I've seen for myself the anger and frustration of ordinary Israelis and ordinary Palestinians. I've seen the terrible destruction inside Janine refugee camp and the horrific aftermath of the last suicide bombing that took place within Jerusalem. I've seen the toll taken on both sides and lives lost and families shattered. I've seen the widespread destruction of Palestinian institutions in the West Bank, damage to the Ministry of Education in Ramallah, to Palestinian non-governmental organizations and charitable organizations long committed to peace and to good governance and to the basic services that ordinary Palestinians so desperately need. And I've seen something which is less tangible, perhaps, but even more troubling. The loss, indeed at times it seems, the death of hope on both sides. The erosion of the dream of peace and reconciliation, the collapse of faith in a better future, a different future, in which two states, Israel and Palestine, can live side by side, as the President spoke, in peace, security, and dignity. There has been far too much suffering and far too much death. Palestinians and Israelis both deserve better than this and must have better than this. Both deserve a future that puts an end to terror and violence, a future that removes the daily threats and fears to the security of ordinary Israelis who worry about whether their children will come home safely or whether their spouses will return from the market or whether this bus ride, this stop in a cafe will be their last. Both people. Israelis and Palestinians, deserve a future that puts an end to the destructive impact of occupation and settlements, a future that stops the daily humiliations of life under occupation, a future that brings Palestinians their own state, responsible, transparent, accountable governance, and the chance for the normal dignified lives that they and their children must have. All the people of the region, including the other states that have not made peace with Israel, Syria and Lebanon, deserve that same future, a future that can only come through negotiations. It's a profound mistake for any party to think that it can come about in any other fashion. And it's equally mistaken to believe that there can be real peace in the area without a settlement that encompasses all of the tracks, Palestinian, Syrian, and Lebanese. None of us should have, and indeed, after the terrible events of the last several months, I think none of us can have any illusions about the task before us. This is going to be very, very hard. Moving forward will require many difficult, many painful decisions. It will require courage, vision, compassion from leaders, and a willingness to speak plain truths to their peoples. It's going to require the international community, all of it, to supply a sense of purpose and determination and generosity and it will require all of us to understand that even in the grimmest of moments and the most bitter of circumstances, the outlines of enduring peace and security for Israelis and Arabs alike remain clearer than ever. The framework for a just, comprehensive, and lasting peace rests squarely on those same principles that produced the Madrid Conference 11 years ago. The UN Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338 the principle of land for peace. We remember vividly, those of us who worked at that time, the hopes, the expectations raised by Madrid. And it is against that backdrop of a possibility of peace in the region 
that the tragedy of the last 20 months has to be contrasted. And that tragedy has to be changed back again into hope. None of us are seeking to replace these terms of reference or to reinvent them. That would be very foolish. It's also unnecessary. What we're determined to do is to build on them, to build on the principles that made that promise of peace in 1991 possible. We want to add the weight and strength of UN Security Resolution 1397. Secretary Powell's Louisville speech of last November, President Bush's April 4th speech, and not least, the historic and quite unique initiative launched at the last Arab summit in Beirut and authored by Crown Prince Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. It's in this spirit that Secretary Powell, our partners in the quartet, the UN, Russia, the European Union, have proposed a ministerial conference to take place this summer in the next few months to resume a political process along the same tracks first laid down in the palace in Madrid. Success in moving away from violence and use of force and back towards a negotiated and comprehensive settlement will only be the product of hard work and hard choices from all of us. The U.S. will have to choose how it will engage and what risks it is prepared to take for peace. Israel and the Palestinians will have to choose as well and show those choices through their actions, just as every other party that supports peace will have to do. In that respect, it was very encouraging to see the strong statement made by Crown Prince Abdullah, President Mubarak of Egypt, after their meeting with President Assad of Syria and Sharm el-Sheikh just a few weeks ago, reiterating a commitment to peace and rejecting violence in all its forms. That is precisely the kind of hard truths, plain spoken determination, if backed up by action, that forces others to look very carefully at where their policies are taking them and challenges them to respond in kind. It is precisely that kind of determination which should persuade the international community more broadly to provide energetic support, not just words, not just criticism, to peacemaking. Now, some argue that the manipulation of violence or the applied use of force can somehow accelerate or shape or even achieve a resolution of this conflict, uh, but we think they're profoundly mistaken. Some argue, on the other hand, that there's no hope for comprehensive peace, no hope for a permanent status settlement on any front in our lifetimes. We think they're just as profoundly mistaken. Now is the time to chart a bold course toward peace, not to resign ourselves to open-ended incrementalism or to coast along passively and pessimistically. Now is the time to choose peace and to act on that choice decisively. U.S. interests, American interests, do not admit to any other course. Now as central as fighting extremism and terror, as central as achieving an Arab-Israeli lasting peace are to the future of the region, they're by no means the only challenges before the societies of the Middle East and before the United States. Economically and socially, it's very obvious to anyone with eyes to see that the region faces enormous difficulties. The truth is that the economic, social, and political inequities in many Middle East countries have grown in recent decades rather than diminished, while Asia, Africa, Latin and Central America, South Asia have all progressed over the last quarter century, the Middle East has lagged behind. Political, economic, social systems and elites are too intertwined and too closed to outsiders. For those who are not already a part of the system, often by birth, advancement sometimes seems hopeless. Corruption is becoming more and more of a corrosive element. These conditions breed despair and a deep dissatisfaction with the status quo and profound alienation. Such an environment inevitably gives rise, whether in the Middle East or elsewhere, to those who wish to destroy their world, their unhappy world, and replace it with an imagined past that never existed, or with a dream of a future which can bring only sorrow. I don't want to dwell on the depressing statistics, but the facts are very sobering and they're unavoidable. Per capita incomes throughout the Middle East are stagnant or dropping. 
while the size of the labor force keeps growing. 45% of the population of the Arab world is under the age of 14. And the population of the region as a whole will double in the next 25 years. Meanwhile, the Middle East, this is the entire Middle East, as a share of world gross domestic product, trade and foreign investment, any indicator you want to choose, continues to diminish. Throughout the region, there's a lack of transparency, very weak or non-existent capital market structures, barriers to trade, and a workforce that simply lacks the skills to compete. On top of this, the region has the lowest per capita water availability in the world. It's often said accurately, capital is a coward. Foreign investors will shy away from economies of the sort that I've just described to you. So will domestic investors. It's striking and depressing that regional Middle Eastern investors have already shifted more than a trillion dollars in investment outside the Middle East. Money talks. And people are making judgments based on their pocketbooks, not on their hearts, not on their country of origin. The Middle East cannot be healthy politically or socially so long as its economies are in crisis. It appears to us, to this administration, that the U.S. has a powerful interest in doing all that we can to help those who want to help themselves in the region, who are willing to take the difficult decisions necessary to open up their economies and expand opportunities socially and politically for all of their citizens. While we can't and won't offer a single model or a simple model for change, we are going to be strong advocates for enhancing private sector involvement, diversifying economies, and narrowing the gap between haves and have-nots. Young people have to emerge from educational systems with appropriate skills for the workforce, not only the skills that their educational systems are now and traditionally best equipped to teach. Globalization has to be seen as an opportunity, not as a threat. Politically, the truth is that many systems in the region don't function effectively as mechanisms for citizens to express or to work out their discontent or their differences or their interests. Political structures all too often serve to insulate the ruling elites from change rather than lead it. The voices of publics are all too often ignored until they rise to a shout. Information can't be controlled and manipulated anymore. Not with the internet, not with CNN, not with Al Jazeera and the other international satellite broadcasting systems. No country in the Middle East today is closed as many were 10, 15 years ago. Satellite TV and the revolution in information technology has ensured that profound changes occurring elsewhere in the world will strike home in the Middle East as well. Now, while we as Americans need to always be mindful of the limits of our influence and certainly of the imperfections of our own system, the delicacy of encouraging political openness, these are tough issues. We have to work with those who seek to deepen respect for rule of law, the rights and sanctity of the individual, and for those who advocate on behalf of the basic principles of civil society. Every culture, every society in this world can find ways to broaden political participation and respect for basic freedoms consistent with their own culture and their own traditions. None of this is going to happen overnight. But we are convinced profoundly that societies which anticipate and get out ahead of inevitable pressures for greater economic and political openness are going to prosper, and that correspondingly, those who fail to do so will fall further and further behind. Whether it is Tom Friedman's fast and slow society, the Lexus and the olive tree, or any other model which you want to apply, the fact is competitiveness is more and more the watchword of this modern world of the 22nd century. It is competitiveness, an educational system that provides opportunities, and a political and social fabric which supports the best of individual progress and self-advancement. These are the societies that are going to advance and prosper. That's the reality of life for all of us, and it's the reality of life for the Middle East. Now, at the end of the day, the choices, whether we deal with tough choices on the war against terror, 
the very difficult, very painful choices that Israel, the Palestinians, others in the region, and we confront in trying to resolve this terrible conflict between Arabs and Israelis. Or whether we're talking about changes in society, changes in politics, in the end, it is those who live in the region themselves who are going to have to make the decisions, not us. But we have an obligation, because our interests are profoundly affected by their choices, to facilitate, to encourage, to support movement in the right direction. At the end of the day, it's their future, but it's also ours. September 11th demonstrated one thing. One cannot exist apart from the broader world. The world reaches in horribly, tragically, on September 11th to touch you, to touch America, to touch Americans. We have a compelling interest in affecting the history of the future of this region. We can't change the past, but we can change the future and we can change the present. The President is committed to doing all he can to do this. It isn't easy. We don't offer quick solutions, but it is something we believe that can be done and must be done. Thank you very much. Would you comment on the, uh, the difficulties of removing settlers from the West Bank? And in contemplating those difficulties, what are American contingency plans? Well, your, your question encompasses several different issues, all of which are, are extremely important. Settlement activity has been profoundly harmful, profoundly corrosive to efforts to make peace, not just today, not just since uh, the outbreak of this intifada, but historically. And the President has been very clear about this settlement activity is not compatible with continued progress towards a meaningful peace. But the decisions that involve settlements are among those questions which Israelis and Palestinians have agreed they will have to resolve amongst themselves. We're not going to prescribe an outcome specifically to that case. But your query about the possible repercussions on the Israeli political fabric of an end to settlement activity that's something that the Israeli people speak to almost every week in polls that are taken in Israel. And those polling results, even amidst the horrors of the suicide bombings of the past months, are very interesting. And they show that a majority of Israeli citizens, I think 57, 58 percent in the most recent polls, would support a complete elimination of settlements in the West Bank and Gaza if, if they believed such a step would bring a true peace with absolute security for Israelis. So you see an equation here. And it's really an equation which is at the core of all of the elaborate presentations that we and others have done over this last year about the Middle East. It's at the core of what the President said on April 4th, what the Secretary said in Louisville last November, which is this, boiled down. Palestinians will not enjoy the realization of their legitimate national aspirations, a state of their own, through either passive tolerance for or encouragement of violence and terror. Israelis will not enjoy their absolutely legitimate demand for security, peace, and a normal life so long as occupation <coughs> continues. That's the core. And it's finding a way to achieve the common objective of Israelis and Palestinians to live in peace and security behind recognized borders that we're all about. Two questions. Sure. The first, uh, what is your view of the complications of the Syrian factor? Mm -hmm. And the second is, uh, why not use pop population control to lessen the, the problems of the area? The demographic challenge posed to the Middle East, 45 percent of the population under age 14, a population doubling in 25 years based on current birth rates, and the paradox that those areas that are most deprived, where the economy is least able to support further population growth, also have the highest growth rates. Gaza, Gaza City, and Camp have one of the highest growth rates uh, per capita in the world, and some of the greatest poverty. We have very active and extremely successful uh, family planning programs, particularly in Egypt, where it has been one of the stars of our Agency for International Development program. 
Uh, this has been an extraordinary success, working hand in hand with the government of Egypt, particularly with Suzanne Mubarak, the president's wife, who has championed this cause, and also in Jordan, which doesn't face quite the same magnitude of challenge as Egypt does, obviously, but still has a significant problem. It's something that can be done very, very effectively when you work with local political and of necessity in the Middle East because of cultural and religious views with the religious establishments there. One of the first things that happened in Egypt when the family planning program was set up was formal endorsements, public endorsements, made by the religious leadership there, that this was not incompatible with the tenets of Islam, nor was it somehow a threat by the West to diminish the ability simply through births of allowing the Middle East or the Muslim world uh, to progress. But it can be done, it is being done, it is one of the most important aspects of our assistance programs in the Middle East today. The first part of your question, dealing with Syria. Syria is a state listed on the state supporters of terrorism list provided every year by the Department of State, designated by the Secretary. We have profound differences with the government of Syria over its support for terrorist groups. Hezbollah, a number of Palestinian groups involved actively in terrorist operations are based in Damascus. Iranian arms flow through Syria to Hezbollah where potentially they could be used to threaten Israel's northern border. These are all problems and we accept no explanation or excuse from the government of Syria for the continued tolerance for these groups. The Secretary of State five weeks ago, a little bit more, told President Bashar al-Assad, Syria doesn't benefit from this relationship with terror. It's hurt. Syria wants a comprehensive settlement, which includes a settlement on the Golan. Syria wants to advance its people economically and socially. We can accept that. Those are fine principles. And we're not going to get into a sterile debate about terrorism, liberation, or freedom fighting movements. We have our views. The Syrian government has its own, which we don't accept. Instead, let's talk about violence. We can all agree, violence sets back the cause of peace. And when Syria tolerates or associates itself with violence, whether that violence takes place across the border from South Lebanon into northern Israel, whether it takes place within the West Bank or Gaza from groups which operate out of or have instructions flowing from or support that passes through Syria. It's all the same. Syria's hurt. Now that looks pretty obvious to us and the, the linear logic of that approach seems pretty clear. And it's something that we hope the Syrian regime grasps because after September 11th, these are critical issues for us. They're not just regional. They're not just local. They're global issues. And ultimately, ultimately, Syria, like many other states around the world, has to decide where it wishes to be. But at a minimum, talking about today, we will not be able to have the normal relationship with Syria that we would like, that we believe most Syrians would like to have, so long as this continues. It is a significant problem. The question was, uh, uh, if indeed helping people to help themselves implies slow economic development, wouldn't a crash program, a Marshall Plan, uh, be better for the Palestinians? And Obje Israelis. And, and every Israelis. Everybody. And everybody. Sure. Yeah, objectively speaking, absolutely. Because what made sense when George Marshall outlined his vision in 47 uh, makes sense today. The problem is this. The Marshall Plan for Europe the economic Marshall Plan, the institution building, market building economic plan was accompanied by a political plan that restructured political institutions for a shattered Europe. Uh, the same needs to be done in the Middle East and the same needs to be done between Palestinians and Israelis. In uh, October of 1993, after the famous signature on September 13th on the White House lawn, we launched such a plan with enormous hope and enormous expectation. The Palestinian expatriate community is enormously wealthy, enormously entrepreneurial, and enormously successful. But, as I said, capital is a coward. And because the Palestinians did not develop, and because at times Israel did not support the development of economic and market institutions necessary to provide an investor-friendly environment, a market-friendly environment, for the, that capital from outside to flow back in, 
in the end. All of that enthusiasm of September 93 eventually dissipated. Would it work today? Yes, I think you could have success today in something that could be roughly called a Marshall Plan. And there's a lot of support for that internationally. Uh, and there's a lot of capital available internationally. Uh, but it's going to require three things. Not just the restructuring of civil and economic institutions, which we very much want to see take place, but security. No one is going to invest in an area where they believe their investment is subject to destruction or closures, which prohibit the flow of goods and services and people. It's not going to work. And finally, there's got to be a political process that underpins both the economic and the institution building aspects. They all have to go together. And if you can get that, if you can do that, which is what we want, this is our strategy, then yes, I think there will be enormous response from the international community. In late April, uh, in Oslo, uh, we received pledges of $1.2 billion uh, for dispersal in this calendar year uh, to provide assistance to the Palestinians. Uh, and there's more money out there. It's not a shortage of resources. It's an environment on the ground in which those resources can be wisely spent, can be wisely applied, not just on meeting urgent, emergent humanitarian needs. You can always do that. But in building infrastructure, that requires stability, requires security, and it requires institutions. Is there a feeling that, that perhaps Bashar Assad is not strong enough to move the peace process forward? Because there are those who say if you can give a push to the Syrian track, this might help the Israeli-Palestinian track. The opposite is also, as you know, often been argued. We, we had an experience over the course of the Oslo years of alternating between the two tracks. Three months or so on Syria, then suddenly something happens on the Palestinian track, then back again to Syria. It wasn't, frankly, a particularly successful formula for either. But Syria and its pursuit of peace and our pursuit of a comprehensive settlement are important to us. And, and I'll just reiterate what I've said before. Anything we do and wherever our focus may be at any one moment, and of necessity, for reasons that I think are very clear, that focus has to be on ending the killing, ending the suffering on the Palestinian-Israeli track, and trying at least to relaunch a negotiating process, even if the goal of that permanent resolution is further out there. While that's our focus for today, we have to be very careful, we try to be, to reiterate that our ultimate goal remains the comprehensive peace on the Syrian, the Lebanese tracks as well, and that the basis for that peace are those fundamental resolutions, 242 and 338, resolution 1397, with which recapitulated 242 and 338 and added two states, Israel, Palestine, and the so-called Madrid principles, land for peace. That hasn't changed. And sooner or later, you're not going to have a just, a lasting, or a comprehensive peace, unless it's a Syrian-Israeli and a Lebanese-Israeli peace. The question, I believe, is would a uh, successful, stable Palestinian state and prosperous Palestinian state threaten other Arab states in the region? And if you believe it would, uh, what plans could deal with that? I could think of few things that uh, would so stabilize the region and be so welcome <clears throat> in a region like the Middle East than an economically stable and prosperous Palestine. Uh, the fact is that the continued festering of the Palestinian refugee issue, which is in large measure an economic question, the continued uncertainties that this crisis, this conflict that goes on decade after decade produces for regimes throughout the Middle East, these are the sources of instability. Now, if the question had been, would a genuinely democratic and transparent Palestine threaten less democratic and transparent regimes in the Middle East, I would say it challenges them, but it's a very good challenge to have and something we certainly should work for. But economically, no, it's the opposite effect. The, the question is, what's the yep. bill yep. for a the successful economic, Palestinian the state? The economic bill. It's, not, it's significant, but it may not be as great or as recurrent as you think. Uh, in summer of 2000, just before this uh, intifada began, after seven years, uh, after Oslo, after the September 13th handshake, the Palestinian uh, Authority's budget ran in the black. Banking sector was doing great. Trade and investment for the first time since Oslo, and paradoxically, everyone says, well, why should Oslo? Why should the introduction of peace create an economic downturn? Well, the answer is this. When Israel ran the show 
in Gaza and the West Bank. It could control the access of workers. And the first source of income for the Palestinian economy was remittances from their workforce in Israel. The legal workforce was around 120, 140,000. The illegal workforce probably topped 200,000 at the time. They were the construction industry and much of the agricultural industry in Israel. Well, with Oslo, with the breakthrough in peace, came the first steps towards separation and closures in which not all workers could work all the time, and eventually very few workers could work some of the time, and then no workers could work any of the time in Israel. And that had a devastating impact. And it took seven years for the Palestinians to begin taking the kinds of decisions necessary to come out of that hole. But they had. And by the fall of 2000, just before the Intifada began, the Palestinian economy was looking better than it had in a decade. And donors were contemplating an end to all of the recurrent budget support, which was running around 80 million a year, uh, provided primarily from the EU uh, and Arab states. We don't provide uh, budget support to the PA. They were contemplating bringing that to an end. Now, there were lots of infrastructure projects out there, mostly in the water field, uh, some in provision of health care. But those infrastructure projects were also on track, and they were very well funded. We're sitting on a half billion dollars, the United States alone, that we can't spend because of the security environment in Gaza and the West Bank. It's not a lack of resources. How quickly could we bring things back, we collectively, if the right steps were taken? I think fairly rapidly. For all the devastation, the snapback, I think, could take place. And the Palestinians have just taken one of the most positive steps they could on the economic and financial side. Uh, yesterday, uh, Arafat appointed Salam Fayyad a very well-known figure in the International Monetary Fund as the Minister of Finance. That alone, in the right environment, uh, would send things up. This isn't the right environment. And so it's just another step holding fire for a different kind of future. But I think that a viable Palestinian state economically can be established. And the bill for the donors, for the international community, which includes the Arab states, who have paid their share of this, may not be as great or as long-term as is often imagined. The question is, uh, do you believe there's been enough of a uh, uh, moral uh, uh, outrage or in, uh, on the part of uh, religious leaders, Arab, both there and in the United States? No. The answer is no. There hasn't been enough of a forceful condemnation by name of suicide bombings. No. Some have, and it's wrong to say no notable religious figures have spoken out. Some of the religious scholars of Saudi Arabia have condemned it as incompatible with Islam. Some in Egypt have condemned it as well. But too often there's either been silence or comments that have led in the other direction, and that's unacceptable. Suicide bombings are not in accordance with the preachings of Islam. They need to be condemned as such, both by secular leaders and by religious leaders, absolutely. And the question is, even if, even if there's a successful political solution, is there not a miseducated youth beneath that that might cause problems in the future? You bet. There certainly is. And this has been a challenge since Madrid, certainly since Oslo. How do you go about changing not just words on paper, handshakes on lawns? They're all important, and they have their place. You have to start at an elite level. But if you want to make peace binding, you have to change mentalities. And you have to do that at a popular level. And you have to do that through education, both what you educate for and what you don't educate for. You're absolutely right. An end to incitement, an end to hatred, an end to the institutionalization of grievance on all sides. Because remember, for 35 years, young Israelis have known the street corners of Gaza and Ramallah and Nablus, and Janin, and Tokarim, they've seen Arabs, Palestinians, as a threat to them in a window, behind a door, in a street. And Palestinians have seen Israelis as young men with guns. Both sides have been poisoned by these 35 years of unresolved conflict, by the terror and violence that has so devastated Israeli psyche and Israeli lives, and by the occupation and what that has brought to a generation and more of Palestinians. It has to start now to change. And education is going to be fundamental 
you're absolutely right. And this is not something that we have been able to change as much as we would have wanted to. It's something that we have worked on with all parties concerned. And we certainly work on it with our friends that you referred to in the Middle East, including Egypt, because they've got a role as well. When I talked about responsibilities for peacemaking and supportive peacemaking, one of those responsibilities that states like Egypt can play most forcefully is to step up, put an end to incitement, put an end to anti-Semitism, begin speaking out in favor of peace. You don't have to agree with the policies of the government of Israel at the moment, not at all. That's not what's required. But end the ostracization and the demonization of a people and a society. That's very important, and it has to happen. Are Palestinians really free, given certain government controls and population controls, uh, to express their opinions? Palestinians have been speaking out about their unhappiness with the institutions that Oslo or their leadership produced for them. They've been speaking out in favor of change, fairly radical change. I don't think that Arafat would have moved on the passage after many years of, of letting it lie in abeyance of a basic law, a constitution, had it not been for popular demand and popular outcry. Are there moderates in Palestine? Of course. This is fundamentally like most communities around the world, a moderate, conservative, urbanized society that wants to get on with its life, just like Israelis, just like most Egyptians and other people around the world. There's nothing unique about them in that regard. Have they been able to speak out as forcefully to change their institutions as we would want? No. As I said in my speech, throughout the Middle East, there is a problem in the ability of people to change their government. But you know, Palestinians are having an impact. And there are polls. Every week there are polls. And they show. They want change. Are, are there negative incentives that might encourage the two sides to resolve the problem? Look, at the end of the day, the United States is not going to impose, nor is it going to allow any other combination of parties to impose a settlement in the Middle East. That kind of imposed, forced resolution is not going to be just lasting. It's certainly not going to be comprehensive for very long. It's going to break apart. The parties themselves, the people themselves, are going to have to make their decisions. And frankly, the Middle East has not been locked like a glacier, immobile and frozen for 50 years. There's been profound change in Israel and in the Arab world. It's that change that manifested itself in what we call Oslo. It's that change that manifests itself in the continued majority of Israelis and Palestinians who understand that painful compromises for a comprehensive and lasting peace are going to have to be made. The peace is going to come. That's not the issue. The challenge is what can the United States do with what combination of allies and friends and partners, with what resources to try to accelerate the day when the resolution arrives, that lasting peace. And so more people don't have to suffer and die and more hope doesn't have to suffer and die. If, um, there, if there's a tension between terrorism on one hand and uh, cooperating with a nation, uh, what do you do? Witness Pakistan, how can you tolerate terrorism while uh, at the same time uh, working with them in other areas? Rich Armitage, the Deputy Secretary of State, just came back this morning from a quite extraordinary mission uh, at a time of enormous tension and enormous fear uh, about the possibilities of both conventional and non-conventional escalation in South Asia. And the essential message which the Deputy Secretary conveyed to President Musharraf was that the infiltrations have to stop. There can't be any equivocation for any reason whatsoever about this. It takes things to the brink. And the message to India was restraint. Give us a chance to see if this message sinks home. And don't act precipitously. Don't act prematurely. President Musharraf and the Deputy Secretary had very good discussions, as Prime Minister Vajpayee had in India. And today, we believe, tensions have begun significantly to diminish. The ban on flights has now been lifted. We hope other steps to de-escalate this crisis continue. But they are absolutely dependent upon an end to infiltrations. And you're right. There is no excuse for terrorist activities, whatever the cause whatever the source. And governments are, in the end, responsible for those who operate from and across their territory. Well, you've asked the, the $64,000 question. And, 
And the answer is this, and I'll give you several parts of that answer, uh, all of which uh, the President has spoken to on many occasions, I think as recently as uh, this morning following his meeting with Prime Minister Sharon. First, uh, a little reality check. We didn't choose uh, Chairman Arafat as leader of the Palestinian people. That was a choice made by the Palestinians themselves. But he is the leader. Leaders have to lead, whether in Palestine or elsewhere around the world. Leadership carries with it not just a title, but an obligation and a set of responsibilities. And leaders are judged by the quality or the failure of their leadership. The President has spoken, I think, quite forcefully of our disappointment in Chairman Arafat's leadership. We have spoken equally forcefully about our hope for fundamental institutional reforms, civil society, transparency and accountability in the structures of governance on the civil side and certainly on the security side, with performance, not words, as the standard by which we and others around the world, but above all the Palestinian people, should judge. Has he performed effectively as a leader? The President has said we're very disappointed in his performance. Can he perform effectively as leader? Well, that's a challenge which has been facing him and will continue to face him. But more importantly, it's a challenge which faces the Palestinian people and the people of the region that have supported him for so long. We want to see a peace. We want to see a just and lasting resolution of this conflict, an end to the violence and terror, an end to the occupation, two people able to leave in peace, security, and dignity. Is Chairman Arafat the leader to do that? That's something which we hope can be made clear through a challenge to all the peoples of the region and all the peoples of the world, a challenge which admittedly we have a major part in, to outline a vision that is credible, substantive, and compelling of an alternate future on the security side, on the institutional side, including economics, and on the political side. And then people have to lead or not. Would you comment on the view that some hold that the United States tilts toward Israel as opposed to the Palestinians? Look, there's profound anger at the United States in the Middle East. It's angered a lot of other parties, too. We understand that. And we take that. We try to deal with that. The real way is not focusing or fixating on the anger or grievances, but finding a way to try to resolve the core issue here, which is this conflict and finding a resolution. Does the United States have a special relationship with Israel? Yes, it does. It's an extraordinary relationship. We have good ties and many partners and friends and strategic allies in the Arab world, but we have a special relationship with Israel. And it is that fact that we, unique of all of the nations on this earth, have that special relationship with Israel, that we have been able to play over the years the role that we have. And that is something which is acknowledged if not by the Arab street, then by many Arab regimes. They may not like it, but they understand the fact that it gives us a special ability to play a facilitating role that we would not have otherwise. It's a role that Europe can't play, Russia can't play, the United Nations can't play. It's a fact of our mingled histories, cultures, and values. And it's something that I think at the end of the day is absolutely essential to a resolution. But that's why they're saying that they hate America. They're saying that for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes simply because we're America. And for no other reason than that, it's a motive seeking and motive assignation for something which is very inchoate and often motiveless. Another version of the question a little before, can't there be negative nudges to encourage a settlement? Well, no. I, I take your question. And it's should the U.S. step up and play a more active role, the implication being that we're not playing that role now, there's something more that we can do. Uh, the answer is yes. We certainly believe that without an active, forceful U.S. role, this is not talking about imposing settlements, but it's an active role in sketching out a vision for peace, uh, it's very unlikely that the parties themselves right now, for the reasons that are so obvious to, to all of you, are going to be able to move. Those are the very issues that the President and we are grappling with right now. It's why President Mubarak, Prime Minister Sharon have come to the White House. It's why Assistant Secretary Burns and before him the Secretary and we traveled to the region. Why Crown Prince Abdullah, King Abdullah, King Mohammed of Morocco all have come within the last three months. 
so that we can formulate, based on input out there and conversations here, what is to be done. But yes, we accept the point. U.S. leadership is essential here. I think the question was, uh, uh, how do you cope with a culture uh, which isn't democratic or Western in its character, and how much is that going to intrude upon a future settlement? All right. Here's the painful reality. In the real world, as opposed to the academic world or the world of op-eds, you've got to square many circles simultaneously. And countries, states have priorities. It is a mistake, and it's a mistake the US has committed all too often in past years around the world, of focusing entirely on the strategic or tactical objectives of the moment and ignoring long-term issues like encouragement of democratization encouragement of civil society growth, encouragement of support for human rights and the rights of individuals. But you can go in the opposite direction. You can make that a priority. And in some places and at some times, that's exactly right. And in other cases, it needs to be melded into a more balanced policy that accepts for now, for maybe the near term, there are other things that are important. Let's turn to the Middle East today. Without question, the United States needs to be seen as a strong and vocal advocate of the rights of individuals, for the rights of civil society, and those who speak out and advocate for civil society, for democratic and transparent systems and open leaderships that are accessible to all. Because the consequence of failure of regimes to develop those kinds of institutions and systems is entirely negative for them, for the region, and for us because it fosters extremism, it fosters instability, not stability. How do you do this? How do you simultaneously conduct war on terror, try to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict, deal with the threat posed by Saddam Hussein, cope with proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and try to begin the process of advocating and facilitating change at a societal level? It's tough, but it has to be done. And we grasp the nettle here in recognizing that you cannot focus entirely on today's objectives. You've got to have a broader goal, and that goal has to, in the end, embrace rights of individuals and civil society. It's hard. It's imperfect. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's got to be part of your policy. It is part of our policy. I very much wish we, we could go on longer. We've reached 710, so we're going to have to uh, uh, call it an evening, but I think this has been a, a marvelously uh, eloquent and, uh, presentation. Thank you.